Well, thank you to uh, Dr. Verstovstek and to the organizers for inviting me, and thank you to the audience I'm, uh, for being guinea pigs. It's the first time I've been invited to talk about chelation, so I appreciate uh, you, your patience with me. I, I've given a lot of, I, I'm a big proponent of iron chelation, and I've certainly given a lot of chelating agents, uh, but this is the first time I've been invited to talk about it, so uh, these are my uh, disclosures. In brief, uh, an overview of what I'd like to talk about uh, with you today uh, is starting with the pathophysiology of iron overload. What are we really talking about here? What are the risks associated with iron overload? Specifically, iron overload and MDS, how does this happen? Um, what could be the potential benefits of chelation? Where do the guidelines for chelation MDS come from? And what are some of the surrogates uh, for um, iron overload and uh, how do we uh, look at this in context of survival. What are the clinical trials that have been done in, uh, uh, for chelation MDS and finally some, some uh, recommendations and uh, some provocative data that was just uh, recently uh, published. So uh, iron overload, we mostly think of transfusion siderosis, secondary and iron overload. Uh, and indeed, uh, increased ferritin accounts for the iron, um, the decreased transferrin receptor blocking entry into cells, and um, the non-bound iron is then engulfed through macrophages and in parenchymal cells of the target organs, uh, the three most common listed here, liver, heart, and, and endocrine organs. But there's also uh, a primary iron overload via hepcidin dysregulation that occurs in the setting of ineffective hematopoiesis. So hepcidin is the master regulator of iron metabolism and typically uh, is dominantly positively regulated through the bone morphogenic protein SMAD4 pathway and in most um, anemias, hepcidin is actually low. In the, um, in the, in the setting of, of iron overload and um, uh, iron of chron chronic disease and inflammatory states, the IL-6-driven um, JAK-STAT pathway, which you've been hearing a lot about in this conference already, is the dominant positive regulator, and hepcidin levels go high. Uh, as Tom Gans first noted about 15 years ago, um, the um, hepcidin levels are, again, low with the standard, uh, with most anemias and are paradoxically high um, in these inflammatory states for the reasons that I just noted. In this first uh, assessment, now uh, 15 years ago, it was clear that there was a, a, sh a very strong correlation between ferritin levels and hepcidin levels. Uh, but this has uh, been debatable, and I'll get back to that in a moment. So this is probably the most obvious slide to this group, um, but I'll just quickly run through why iron overload le leads to, to, to problems. Uh, as ferritin rises uh, and transferrin uh, falls, non-transferrin bound iron rises and converts um, when the storage capacity is exceeded into this labile um, uh, plasma iron, which is the redox active form of, uh, of iron and, and leads to uh, free radicals. And free radicals, as we all know, can cause lipid paradoxation, DNA damage, gnomic instability, um, HSC damage, um, which is the, uh, the thought behind the hypothesis of how chelation can actually stimulate hematopoiesis. And then, of course, um, what we most deal, mostly deal with with iron overload is the non-hematopoietic tissue damage in the heart, liver, and uh, pancreas, eye, skin, and so forth. In MDS, about 90% of patients are anemic at some point in their disease course, and most of them receive chronic transfusions. Iron overload is, um, at least historically, thought to be more associated with the lower risk MDS because those patients are around longer to receive more transfusions. With new therapy and higher risk patients living longer, this is not always the case, and clearly um, there are exceptions to this. Um, one thing we do know is that the uh, frequency uh, and the um, volume of transfusions at, in a short period of time is, of course, more damaging and more likely to re lead to more. Uh, activation of free radicals and iron overload than uh, long-term uh, iron, uh, long-term transfusion. So in other words, 20 transfusions over the course of 20 weeks um, is uh, probably a greater risk factor than 40 transfusions 
over 50 or 60 weeks. So uh, this in mind, the, the value of chelation is, is, um, is based on when, when the plasma iron exceeds the transferring binding capacity in this iron over, uh, overload situation. And the question is how to really measure that. Well, the first guidelines that were, even though I accessed this just in August, um, the NCCN guidelines for a while and low-risk patients have recommended that patients who have um, more than 20 transfusions and ferritin greater than 2,500 should be, um, sh should be chelated. And um, this is fairly conservative. The MDS Foundation is a little more aggressive and recommends consideration of chelation for patients who have ferritin over 1,000. You could see that, um, and I, I just thought it would be easier to show you a, a table with all of the uh, different guidelines across, around the world, which all concentrate on you know, similar um, markers of iron overload, serum, serum, serum uh, ferritin, uh, similar patient profiles, lower risk MDS, and then um, many of them have recommended target serum ferritin levels. This is a picture of, um, you know, until I came to Vanderbilt, I didn't really know what a squid looked like, so that's what it looks like if you've never seen one. Um, but um, mostly is used um, in, for research purposes. So other than biopsy and, and expensive testing, really our, our main biomarker for, uh, for, te for checking for iron overload is, is ferritin. And um, years ago, this um, it was a paper published by David Steensma when he was at the Mayo uh, that, that um, raised several eyebrows on the use of ferritin in, 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 in patients with MDS. And this is a group of MDS patients who had serum ferritin above and below 1,000, and there was really no survival difference. Now, this was a small number, and it was, uh, you know, uh, it was only 14 patients who had serum ferritin over 1,000. Um, but um, that uh, certainly g gave pause to the, to the use of this as a biomarker for iron overload. Uh, however, um, Guillermo Sanz's group in, in Spain, and these are all retrospective analyses, but the Guillermo Sanz's group in Spain has since further refined this, looking specifically at different target uh, organ risk and, and um, the benefits of, 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 of chelation. And the patients who were chelated um, clearly had a better survival. And of those patients, the median ferritin levels were around 2,000. In addition, um, the specific comorbidities associated with each of the target organ iron overloads seem to improve. And I showed an example here of the um, time to cardiac complications uh, being um, uh, greatly extended when patients were adequately uh, chelated. So we don't have a lot of forest plots that look like this in MDS, um, but um, this meta-analysis can show you in a snapshot of the survival analyses with chelation, the overall um, odds ratio ranges between two and five uh, in favor of, uh, of chelation. There were five retrospective analysis, there were three prospective analysis in this meta-analysis, and almost all these patients were low and in one lower risk um, MDS. Another thing that doesn't get mentioned often is not just chelation, it's adequate chelation. Uh, and as patients' transfusion me needs grow, you have to continue to, as I tell them, it was two steps forward, one step back, now it's two steps forward and we have to avoid three steps back. So increasing chelation to keep up with the um, growing uh, iron overload is, of course, uh, uh, important. So and this uh, French analysis can, sh can show you in a snapshot how patients uh, who were adequ adequately chelated uh, did, did better, and clearly the patients who were weakly chelated had really no benefit over those who weren't chelated at all. There's been um, several clinical trials looking at chelation in MDS. In the past 10 to 15 years, almost all of these trials have been with oral chelators, uh, dysferosirox uh, and deferperone. Um, Dysferosirox um, is, is uh, in the United States is the most common oral chelator, and um, in all of these trials, you can see that um, there was at least some benefit with reduction in labile plasma iron, in liver iron content, or in ferritin. The exception I put in a red box just to show you in this um, 
the uh, extend and exchange study, there was a cohort of patients who had previously been chelated, and as you might expect, those patients had less benefit to receiving oral chelation after failure of uh, IV or sub-Q chelation. Now, these chelators work in a variety of different ways. Um, Desferosorox um, works directly on hepcidin uh, and blocks um, the oxidation of la uh, the, tran the um, transformation to, to labile iron. Um, and, and really is um, probably uh, the, the most, even though clinically the, 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 not really clear that there's a superiority with oral chelation, that it seems to have the most potent effect on um, iron overload on a cellular level. Uh, dif desferoxamine, wor uh, uh, desferoxamine works in a lot of different ways, blocking transfer from non-transfer bound iron to um, the uh, autophagy of vesicles with um, uh, 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 fer ferritin and blocking further storage of, of, of iron and uh, ferritin. Now, the options for chelation include uh, uh, diferoxamine, can be given subcutaneously or IV. Um, I have um, patients receiving both. I have patients that uh, go home and go to sleep with uh, subcutaneous um, chelation, and I have patients who come into the clinic for IV if they're tossers and turners and can't have a, um, a, a, subcutane a needle in their arm as they sleep. Uh, we have um, uh, desferosorox uh, is most commonly used and does definitely leads to quicker reduction in, in iron levels and measured by ferritin, uh, but is very hard to get paid for if your platelets, if the patient's platelets are low, which is a problem when you're talking, talking about MDS patients. The black box warning for uh, desferosorox is around um, uh, GI bleeding, which is largely related uh, to um, low platelets, and that's why this is hard to, to, get, to get this drug for the patients who also have uh, thrombocytopenia. There's a new formulation which is advertised outside this room, which I have had some success with, and this is a, um, a capsule in, in, instead of a, um, a powder that is mixed with a orange juice or fluid and does, uh, is designed to cause a lot less gastric irritation, and, and that's, been, uh, that's been successful clinically in our practice. So one of the final things I'll talk about just on this, uh, th this, is a, 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 this is a head of print, a Polish group noted the um, HFE mutations present in about 30% of patients, and this predicted, this is both heter this is heterozygous and homozygous uh, mutations predicted for overall survival in MDS, which l begs the question if the benefit that we're seeing with chelation is among the patients who have a heteroz heterozygosity for mutation in HFE. Um, a lot of uh, more digging needs to be done here, um, but it is a, a provocative question, and uh, we'll see what becomes of this. So uh, just to conclude and to stay on time, um, Iron overload is a common uh, complication of MDS, particularly in low-risk disease, but as the treatment improves and patients live longer and have more years to accumulate uh, iron with uh, secondary hemosiderosis, higher-risk disease it will, be, will become an issue. Um, the causes are multifactorial. We do have patients with ineffective hematopoiesis who develop hepcidin dysregulation, and clearly there's um, uh, dysfunction there, and agents directed towards hepcidin metabolism are certainly in, uh, in development in clinical trials. Um, we know that chelation improves iron overload uh, associated morbidity, and um, it appears to improve the surv survival in MDS. Um, I use all different types of chelation. There are a growing number of options that you can use for your patients, um, and it seems to be something that is uh, and really, um, and I have to say it's getting better, but I, for the referred patients that I see, uh, the, a growing number, are, of course, are, but still a vast uh, majority of patients that come to the clinic uh, are under-chelated or not chelated, uh, and, and clearly there's a role for chelation in, in, in MDS. Thank you for your time.